When we open our Bible and study the Gospel of Mark, a little bit of background first on the man and then on the letter, the kind of the when and where, provides us with not just, um, not just the background of this little pamphlet of the Gospel of 16 chapters, but also the context from which it was derived. It's incredibly important to settle out who the writer is and what context they're writing in because that's going to help you a great deal to understand the flow of the book and we're going to hit it hard and, and move quickly. As best we can tell, John Mark is the author and he appears to be from a wealthy family that hosted the church meetings in Jerusalem. One of the original house churches in Jerusalem was apparently his mama's house. Now, young John Mark is likely the youth that was following Jesus in the garden the night, it says, in which he was betrayed in Gethsemane. And there was a young man there, and the soldier grabbed his cloak, and his cloak came off, and he ran away naked, meaning his legs were showing and only his tunic was on. Uh, apparently, that is John Mark, and that's the reason it only shows up in this book. It doesn't show up in the other Gospels, because he's telling you something about himself. We assume that he was led to Jesus by Peter. And Peter later on calls him my beloved son. So apparently even during the ministry of Jesus, the disciples when they went out actually did make disciples and bring some of them back. And some of them were hanging out even the night in which Jesus was betrayed. We know that Barnabas um, was related to John Mark. They were cousins. Barnabas was a nephew of Mark's mother, and therefore that made him Mark's cousin. And Colossians 4.10 can be consulted for that. Paul esteemed Mark worthy to come on the first mission journey in Acts 13.5, as did Barnabas, his cousin, and they brought him along. But the problem was John Mark flaked out. This is a young man who, when he went, he deserted them in Acts 13, 13, and turned back when he got to the southern edge of what today is called Turkey, after they had been through Cyprus. You have to know something about them. They're a Cypriot family. That is, they're a Cyprus family with a home in Jerusalem with wealth. And whatever combination that made, it meant that when they were in Cyprus, John Mark was all about being a part of the journey, but when they got to southern Turkey, he wasn't all about going up that uh, steep mountain pass into the Taurus Mountains, and for one reason or another, he turned around and left. You remember how that played out. By the second missionary journey, that became the falling out point between Paul and Barnabas that caused Barnabas and John Mark to end up going back to Cyprus, and in fact, Paul chose Silas and went off and did what we would call the second missionary journey that we study today beginning in Acts 15, end of Acts 15, verse 36. The point is that um, Barnabas and Mark sailed off to Cyprus and are never seen in the, in the book of Acts again. I'm not saying they didn't do something important. I'm saying that Dr. Luke followed the story of Paul and Barnabas and John Mark went off the end doing what they had to do. But they were alive. They were witnessing. They were making disciples. It's interesting because the early sources suggest that Mark remained very active in ministry. And in fact, Paul mentioned him in Colossians 4.10. And by the end of Paul's life, that would be about the year 67 in the common era. By the end of Paul's life, he was convinced that John Mark was again useful to God in ministry. Paul had done a 180 and turned around from the early bitterness of that argument. The early sources suggest to us a number of things. One of the things we know is that, that um, Mark was probably writing while Claudius was um, waning in the last years of Claudius, Emperor Claudius's rule. And if you know anything about that time period, uh, Claudius was on his fifth wife. Her name was Agrippina, and she was carefully sculpting a way to get her son by a previous man into the place of wearing the purple after Claudius and move Claudius's children by previous women out of the way. By the way, her son was a guy by the name of Nero. And it worked on her part until Nero turned on her and killed her. So the end of her life was that she actually backed the wrong horse, if, you, if I can say it that way. Now, an overview of Mark's gospel includes a little bit of historical background. The thing is written probably in the, in the middle 60s. Some scholars will say it's written as early as the 50s. I think it's written in the middle 60s. And it's write, written from Italy. He has to explain Aramaic terms. He has to explain Jewish things. So clearly it's written to Gentiles. 
If this was written to Jews, he wouldn't explain Jewish things. If he's explaining it, it means that the uh, recipients are in fact Gentile. I, I want you to know that during that last time of Claudius's reign and the rise of Nero, there was uh, a slow burning persecution that was already beginning against the Christian faith. So you ought to see in the background John Mark writing about the time when stuff is starting to get heated up underneath of the Christian faith. Mark was probably in his mid-40s to early 50s by the time he wrote this gospel. And the interesting thing about this gospel is he had been with Peter in Rome for a long time. 1 Peter 5.13 uh, mentions Rome as Babylon. Peter doesn't call Rome, Rome. But Mark was likely originally brought to Jesus by Peter, and that's why 1 Peter 5.14 calls him his spiritual son. Here's what we know. Do you remember the story when Peter was arrested and they were having a prayer meeting? I'm talking about Acts 12. And they were praying that Peter would get out of prison, and he did. And they were all shocked, because Christians often pray and don't think God is going to say yes, because so they keep saying it anyway. We talk about how we believe in prayer, but a lot of times we disbelieve our belief. And what's interesting is that Mark went on to be a close, he's called the interpreter of Peter. Now, that doesn't mean that Peter didn't speak well enough to be heard. Peter was a fisherman from the north side of the Sea of Galilee. He ends up as a, as a, uh, a, a head of all the Bible study leaders, a bishop in the place in the center of the empire at Rome. And he, he's not that profoundly educated. John Mark is from a much wealthier family, and John Mark probably has a much more Latin background. And in fact, John Mark includes in Gospel of Mark more Latinisms than anybody else does because he knows the Latin language better. So, so traveling with Peter as Peter preaches is this younger man, John Mark, who understands the Roman society better. He had a better education. He hung out in the better places. And one of the things I find interesting is Eusebius, uh, the early church historian said this, so great were his converts when Mark was sent to Egypt. So great were his converts, both in number and sincerity of commitment, that the great Jewish philosopher Philo was amazed. In other words, he often spent time with Peter, but at one point he was dispatched to go to Egypt and he did such a good job that a, a, a whole wave of people in Alexandria came to know Jesus as Messiah. Maybe it's that that told John Mark, it's time somebody write down the gospel. It's time somebody listen to what Peter and John and the others are saying and begin to write out a gospel. So Mark takes it on. By the way, Mark apparently died in Alexandria Egypt, but you will not find his body there. It's in Venice, because in the ninth century, the Venetians came and stole the body. Because if you don't have your own holiness, you borrow somebody else's and steal it and bring it to St. Mark's. So St. Mark's Cathedral has, as its feature, a relic of a stolen body of an apostle. I've never quite understood the holiness aspect of this, but if you can grasp that, you can go to see St. Mark's, which is a beautiful place. Okay, a couple of words on the letter before we get into it. Mark's attempt is to present a full-on, ready-for-prime-time miniseries. When you, when you read this book, it moves. I mean, it's all about action. And he uses the word immediately 41 times. Uh, you're immediately to death by the 16th chapter. I mean, Jesus is going and running, and he's here, and then immediately he's there. And he's not trying to say that's how it happened. He's trying to say, the next thing I want to tell you is this, and the next thing I want to tell you is this, and then there's another thing I want to tell you is this, and then I want to tell you about this. And you just feel like he's, he's just spitting it out at you in rapid fire um, um, movement. And the other thing I think that's interesting is Matthew focuses on the words of Jesus, but Mark focuses on the works of Jesus. So if you want to know where Jesus said something, you go to Matthew, because it's got a lot more red in the red letter edition. But if you want to know where Jesus did something, go to Mark, because Mark chapter 1, he hits the ground running. There's not even a birth narrative in Mark. It's not important how he got, boy, he, he's in there, he's ministering, let's go for it. And that's what the book is designed to do. A third of this book, a third of this book is about the last week of Jesus' ministry. And so the first two-thirds get you through three and a half years, and the last third is one week. 
And Mark is really obsessed with the things that happened in Jerusalem in the last hours before Jesus was, was arrested. Obviously, Mark is the shortest of the gospel accounts. But something else you should know, all the other gospel accounts appear to repeat or echo some things that Mark wrote. In fact, if, if, if Mark can be seen as the base of Matthew and Luke, here's what I want you to know. All but 31 verses in Mark are repeated in Matthew and Luke. In other words, there's only 31 unique verses in Mark that you won't see in Matthew and Luke. I think God laid on the hearts of Matthew and Luke to expand on things, but the outline came essentially from Mark's gospel. I think it's interesting, but um, one of the important things is that the gospel is based on the teachings of Peter. And, and because the gospel of Mark is based on the teachings of Peter, as best we know, it means that Mark is traveling with Peter. He's listening to the stories. He's writing down stories. The Spirit of God is using those stories to, to spark something in Mark. And here's what I want you to know. The disciples do not come off well in the gospel of Mark. You, you'd think, see, when, a, when somebody leaves the cabinet of the president and they write one of those kiss and tell books from the White House, they usually reflect the people they like on the cabinet as good. It's interesting because this doesn't reflect a good... These are clueless disciples for 16 chapters. In fact, reading and studying for tonight, I poured over this book about 10 times this week, and here's what I can tell you. I'd have fired every one of them. There wasn't a, there wasn't a man in the bunch that showed great promise at the time. And that shows you that Jesus' view of a disciple is not man's view of a disciple. Jesus looks at you and me and the bumbling we do and he sees where we're going, not where we are. Mark appears to be very, very focused on something and I'm not sure I saw this until I was studying for this. He is really focused on Jesus' alone time with his father. You, you know what I found? 20 times in the book he cites Jesus getting alone with his father. Alone time for Jesus. I, I, I had never seen that before. I wrote down all the verses. I won't give them to you right now, but if you want them, I'll give them to you. It is amazing to me how much he focused on Jesus. Absolutely, even in the fast story, knew how to break away and get alone. Mark loved to record the crowd's reactions. 20 different times, the crowd was either amazed or astonished. I think either he lacked words to say what he was seeing or what he was seeing over and over was the Spirit of God at work in the audience and he just, he just saw an audience turn into a congregation while he was watching. Mark is also focused on showing how to follow Jesus. I, I didn't realize that 17 times in the Gospel of Mark the word follow shows up. He's really into, I want to show you how to follow Jesus. Because it's not just important that you know that Jesus came and that he died. I want you to follow him. I think it's in interesting because I, I believe that Mark is intended primarily for Romans. And um, that's why he makes no reference to Jewish law. He quotes from the Hebrew scriptures only twice in the whole book. And everything that has a Hebrew word or an Aramaic word behind it, he translates again which I find annoying when you're reading it, you know, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. That's what Bartimaeus means, but he says it that way anyway because the reader might not know that. One of the interesting things is it's in the Gospel of Mark that Pontius Pilate actually comes off fairly as a good guy. It's in the Gospel of Mark that a soldier standing by the cross looks up and says, surely this was the Son of God. Why? Because he's writing to Romans, and some of those are soldiers. And he picks up the stories that the Spirit of God lays on his heart that are good stories about them. If, you know, honestly, God knows what we need to hear that's going to bolster us and draw us in, and, and I believe that's there. Now, let's take your Bible, open up to Mark chapter 1, and I'm not going to stop and be reading for 16 chapters, or we obviously won't be able to get out of here within the time frame. Here's what I can tell you. I can tell you the story opens up in chapter 1, verses 1 to 13, with what we call the pre-ministry narratives. That is, before the ministry of Jesus, and this is in Judea, and Mark opened with the promise that the message of Jesus was good news. This was a gospel of Mark. It's good news. And it was promised news in verses 1 to 3 by Isaiah long before. It was endorsed news in verses 4 through 8 because John the baptizer endorsed what Isaiah promised. And then 
Endorsement above all endorsements, verses 9, 10, and 11 of chapter 1, God spoke from heaven. Now you want a good endorsement? That's as good as it gets. The creator of the universe breaks in and says, this is my son. I'm happy with what he's doing. I'm pleased. Truthfully, that's probably the theme verse that runs behind the book. But when you look at it, the proclamation of God was made clear. Now here's what I want you to know about this book. John Mark, from the voice of Peter, with the moving of the Spirit, was keen to let you know that as soon as God said, this is my son, Satan went, oh, okay. And he turned up the fire and the problems began. At the moment that Jesus was announced, the next story in verses 12 and 13 is a dramatic and immediate attack by Satan on Jesus in the wilderness. It's almost as if until God publicly proclaimed which one was Jesus, I'm not sure Satan knew exactly where he was hiding. I think he went as a baby, had a host of angels over him, slipped out of the public scene, ended up in Egypt, ended up in Nazareth, and all of a sudden he's standing, getting baptized. God breaks in and says, this is him. And the enemy says, all forces right there. Go after that one. And the interesting thing is that the popular ministry begins in verse 14 of chapter 1 and goes all the way to almost to the end of chapter 8. This is the popular ministry. So pre-ministry is 1, 1 to 13. Popular ministry, 1, 14 to 8, 26. And the popular ministry is largely in the Galilee. That's the region of the Sea of Galilee on the west side and the mountains to the west of it. And, and, and most of what's going on in that place is Jesus in front of the crowds. Now, Mark recalled that in 1.14 and 15, the move to inaugurate the public ministry began, and he began to choose disciples in 1.16 to 20, and all that was around news that he received that John the baptizer, his cousin, had been arrested. Mark remembers that the kickoff point for Jesus to really go big into the popular ministry was his cousin was now under arrest. You know from the other Gospels that Jesus was already ministering before that, but, but Mark skips right to the point and says, he really turned up the fire when John was under arrest. What I think is interesting is if you go toward the end of chapter 1, he goes to Capernaum, and in verses 21 to 28, I want you to see how the enemy starts laying one glove after another of combination punches on Jesus. He, he's... he's Chosen disciples, he's beginning to model in verses 16 to 20, and in 21 to 28, he goes into a synagogue, and uh, right as he goes in, there's a disruption. See, the synagogue, he's being heard, and he's being received. He comes out of the synagogue, and the, and the mother-in-law of Peter is sick, and now the servant team is down, and he's got to stop and heal her. And, and, and the next thing that happens is, from the synagogue, there's a demon and a demonic power that immediately ensues. You see that in 132 and 33. Do you know what the demons were trying to do? The very first demon he encountered in Capernaum shouted out, Jesus, we know who you are. The next demons in 32 and 33, they wanted to proclaim who he was. Why? How many of you think that the demons were doing that to help, help, him, to, you know, help him along in his ministry, to get him on his feet? No, they wanted fame to swamp the boat. They wanted to keep disrupting the ministry. You know what's interesting? When you read chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, you read that, that he began to teach and people began to clearly hear truth. And as the truth started to hear them, the demon comes out of the guy and starts shouting about who Jesus is. You think it's good words, but what it is is a distraction from them hearing the truth. I think what's interesting is Follow the story all the way down to the end of chapter 1. And he finds himself having to leave that area and move the base of ministry for a time. And verses 35 to 39 in chapter 1 say that he has, to, he has to pull out and he has to get to a place where he can get a little bit of breathing room. See, the, the, the demons have made him so popular so fast that they didn't have a way of, of doing crowd control. And they just came right down on top of them. Interestingly enough, when he withdrew a little bit, another man came to him, a leper. 
who needed to be healed. And in verses 40 to 45, at the end of chapter 1, we close chapter 1 with a disobedient leper. A leper who comes and says, would you heal me? If you're willing, I can be healed. Jesus said, okay, I'll heal you. And sternly leaned into him and said, now don't tell anyone. And the man went out and told everyone he could. And through the disobedience of a believer, the demonic powers got influence in the ministry of Jesus and disrupted the ministry. See, what the demons couldn't get direct from the demon-possessed people inside the synagogue they could get from a disobedient believer. What does that tell you? It tells you that sometimes the greatest tool of Satan is somebody who's on our team. And they can disrupt the whole thing and be used of him. Paul will later on write and say to Timothy that the enemy takes captive some of our people to disrupt our people. Those are believers, not unbelievers. I'm not saying they're demon-possessed. I'm saying they're ornery and disobedient. That's all you got to be to distract the ministry. You've never met anybody like that, so let's move on. The, the point of chapter 1 is this. Jesus has a spiritual enemy, and he is vanquished, but he's not eliminated. And because he's not yet eliminated, he's not ready to capitulate. He's not given up. He's gone down with a fight. And so here's the thing. He used the one strategy, the one strategy he loves to use, and that is to destroy the advance of God's people by confusion, disruption. So I open up chapter 2, and here's what I see. I see that chapter 1 set up a battle between the physical and the spiritual world, but in chapter 2, the form of the attack was more subtle. It became a little bit masked. There are four stories in chapter 2, and, and they're all about the problem between Jesus and the Pharisees and religious leaders of his time. Essentially, Mark, Mark offered a couple of insights, and the very first one, I, I love this story in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. This is the story of a man who's brought in on a pallet, and when he's brought to Jesus on a pallet, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. And Jesus is done. The man's still laying on the pallet, but his problem is fixed. Because the problem was in his heart. And so the Pharisees standing around begin to murmur. Who is this guy to forgive sins? And Jesus said, wait a minute. Oh, you want to see him walk? Get up and walk. The guy got him walked. He said, which one of these things do you think is harder? To tell him his sins are forgiven or his feet can work? You think, you think, religious leaders, that the issue is about the physical world, but the issue is about the broken hearts of men. You're on the wrong page. What I think is interesting is the second story that picks up in verses 13 to 17 shows that the leader had an inability to think like God. The Pharisees and the scribes, they couldn't think like God. Jesus is all of a sudden calling now uh, some disciples, and he calls Levi to be a disciple, and he finds himself in the house with Levi and a whole bunch of other tax collectors and garden variety sinners. Now, the truth of the matter is, the Pharisees don't understand the value of these sinful men because that's not on their list. They have valuable people and people they don't care about. And these are the people they don't care about. So they, they look at Jesus and they don't understand why the Savior would come and spend time with the likes of those people. And Jesus said, you think I came for the well people? I came for the sick ones. I came for the people who know that they need something, not the people who feel self-satisfied. See, I need... I need people who feel worthless and are prepared to surrender, not people who feel self-sufficient and think they're sufficiently righteous to have earned the kingdom of God. The third story, the third story in the chapter is also interesting because it's another misunderstanding of the Pharisees with Jesus. They come to him and they say, in verses 18 to 22, Jesus, here's the thing. Uh, our disciples are observing a fast. John's disciples are observing the fast. We notice that your disciples are eating. So can you explain that to us? And Jesus said, you don't really know the value of who I am. That's really what he said. He said, when the, the bridegroom is here, the bride doesn't fast. The, the problem is you're looking at me as some guy that grew up as a stonemason from Nazareth, son of Joseph. You don't know who I am. If you knew who I was, you would tell them to bring out the banquet and the best that they have. And instead you're going, why aren't you fasting? Because you don't fast when the prince is here. The prince wasn't recognized. They didn't understand his importance. 
But that's not all they didn't understand. When you get toward the end of chapter 2, this is chapter 2, verses 23 to 28, you begin a series of stories that are a whole new issue that rise up. Sabbath problems continue to confront Jesus' ministry. See, here's the problem. God commanded, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. We're all on that page, right? But, but here's the thing. He commanded to the Jewish people that the seventh day in which God rested, they were to observe, and that that was to be a special sign between God and the Jewish people. Jesus was Jewish. His followers were Jewish. But the problem was that they added through religious experience a number of laws to the Sabbath. And one of them, they said, was, you can't pick barley and eat it on the Sabbath off the stalk. Now, think about it for a minute. What's the difference between that and serving uh, corn on the cob at the uh, Sabbath table? Corn on the cob hadn't yet been discovered, and that would be a reason they didn't. But my point is this. Nowadays, no rabbi would have a problem with what these rabbis had a problem with with Jesus. But Jesus looked at them and said, you placed rules on people and made them equal with the word of God. And that's a problem. Because I don't follow your rules, I follow my Father's rules, and that's what verses 23 and 20 to 28 really deal with. And when you get to Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, it's another kind of Sabbath problem. This Sabbath problem is that, that the, the Pharisees had interpreted and built a strong defense around their teaching that you cannot make a person well on Sabbath. By the way, that's no longer true. After the time of Jesus, Jews now side with Jesus, not with these Pharisees. You can run an ambulance on Sabbath. In Jerusalem, you can run an ambulance. You can be a doctor on Sabbath. You can fix a leg on Sabbath. Why? Well, they use such things like, well, if a donkey was to fall into a pit, you could get them out. Sounds a lot like the Gospels. But when Jesus came, he said, look, he saw a guy with a withered hand sitting in the synagogue. He said, stretch it out. And it was made well. And they began to, to get so upset that it literally says they plotted to kill him by verse 7. So when you get to uh, uh, verses 8 and following, here's the problem. The crowds follow. Now we're back to the fame attack. See, he's had a couple of religious punches from the Pharisees and scribes, but the enemy, he's not just pinning him down on theological debate, he's also throwing other punches. Let's get back to the attack of the enemy through fame. And so it says that the crowds followed and Jesus had to create some barriers to become effective because he couldn't possibly pull off the teaching. And the demons went on the activity to try and increase his fame. And in verses 8 through 12, they kept helping his preaching. The demons were going, yeah, yeah. And Jesus kept saying, stop talking. Stop talking. Why? Because they wanted to fan the flames and overwhelm the ministry. And Jesus countered. Now, interesting, in verses 13 to 19, you know what the counter he used? He got a bunch of disciples together and he empowered them to cast out demons. He figured, I'll split this thing up and make it really hard for them to get me. If a, if a bunch of people in the room all have the power to, to cast out demons, guess what? We can get them out of them faster than they can talk. And Jesus is just fighting the battle by empowering disciples, causing the pressure to recede for a little while. The remainder of chapter 3 intertwines two stories. And I want you to see these two stories. One of them, on the one hand, the fame of Jesus grew to the, uh, to the point where the crowds were no longer controlled. And the disciples weren't even able to eat, it says. And so Jesus came to... Uh, um, uh, uh, the disciples, and they're all together, and he's trying to pull them out and take them uh, uh, um, away from that, but he can't get them away. His family shows up, and this is one of the two intertwined stories. His family shows up to see him. <laughs> Jesus, come out and see your mother. Come out and see your brothers. And he turns, and he knows that they're there to take him back to Nazareth because they think he's lost his mind, and they're going to stop him from doing his ministry so he doesn't go out to them. He says, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? You who follow me are my mother and brothers. But there's another story that's intertwined with it. And it's, it's, an, it's a story that um, he refused to give the family opportunity, but at the same time, the rising tide of pressure from the teachers of the law also became noticeable. And they began to credit Jesus' power with the enemy. And Jesus turned in chapter 3, verses 22 to 30, and he, and he made sure that they understood 
that if they didn't change their approach and stop blaming uh, Jesus' power on the enemy, but rather put it over to the Holy Spirit, they were going to face a very, very tough penalty. Jesus basically used this reasoning. He said, you guys don't make any sense. A house divided against itself won't stand. How, how would Satan cast out Satan? You don't make any sense. And you better change your tune. Now, that means by the time you come out of chapter 3, there's pressure in the family because they're not happy because I don't know what your mama would say if you didn't come out and see her. And, and, and there's also mounting theological pressure. And so chapter 4 begins a series of parables that you know from Matthew 13. But, but in Ma Mark chapter 4, it's clear that these parables are given with the background of a pressure cooker that's going on in the ministry. And Jesus is going to try and reflect what is the spiritual value system that you should see success through in the physical world. And, and so he literally tells the parable of the sower. And he brings out some internal questions by the disciples because they start asking him, we don't really get what all these mean. So it's interesting because he explains the meaning and says, you have to be unashamed of walking with me in verses 21 to 24 of chapter 4. He, uh, he took the time in verses 9 to 20 to explain the teaching in 21 to 24. He said, it all comes down to this. You cannot be afraid of standing up for me. You can't be. I think it's interesting. One of the things he does is he talks about the transformative work of the Spirit of God in the life of a believer, and specifically the disciples in chapter 4, and he talks about it with the mystery of the way the, soul, the, the soil produces uh, uh, um, something from a seed. He says, you know what? When I see people change, it's just like seeds. You throw these seeds in the ground, and you don't exactly know how it works, but out comes this stalk, out comes this plant, out comes this flower, out comes this vegetable. He said, it's like that. The values of the kingdom are very different than those of the physical world, but you can see some realities in the physical world. By the way, verses 30 to 34 of chapter 4 said he only used parables in public, but privately he would take the disciples aside and he would explain it to them. Mark knows that because Peter was there and Peter shares with him. You know, he did a lot of that parable stuff and people got ruffled about it. But I got to tell you, at night it was really good because sitting around the campfire, Jesus would tell us what it was he meant. I, I think it's interesting, too, that there's a second story that's recalled by Mark from the following uh, day of teaching of the uh, Capernaum. He's been teaching all day. He's been teaching the parable of the sower and he, he does this big, long teaching. And then he gets in the boat and he's wiped out. At the end of chapter 4, he's exhausted. So he gets in the boat with the boys and he says, let's go over to the other side. And, and you need to know, he's in Capernaum, he's on the west side. He says, let's go over to the east side. That's the Gentile side. There are no kosher delis over there. What's he trying to do? Shake off the crowd. He needs to get rid of this incessant crowd so they can get a little time to settle down. And Jesus is tired. He gets in the boat and they start moving eastward across the Sea of Galilee and he goes to sleep on a pillow in the back on the raised part of the stern. They get out there and a storm of wind whips up and they begin to catch water inside the boat and they wake him up and say, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? He gets up and says, knock it off and the wind stops. And they all stand there. Now, the point is that the real storm hasn't come yet. That's the one that's going to come on the land. He's just getting them ready. And they arrive at the other side. In chapter 5, there are three stories, and they're all stories of healing. The first one starts on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and out of a tomb comes a man who's been cutting himself that's loaded with demons. Now, that is the trifecta nightmare for any Jew. Guy's in a tomb. He's a Gentile. He's been cutting himself. These are all things Jews have nothing to do with. So Jesus is getting off the boat, and the disciples are hesitating to get off the boat. And the guy's right there by the seaside in the a steep cliff area on the east side. We know exactly where it is, by the way. There's only one place around the sea where that could happen. And the guy comes out of the tomb. And, he, and Jesus has a conversation with Legion, for we are many. And he casts the demons into the swine, and the pigs run down the slope and go into the water. And the only good thing about the story is the pigs die. I'm sorry, we got a, a vet here, but it's a Jewish story. Pigs die, we're all happy. So the point is that the end of it is the man standing there saying, Oh, I'm free of my demons. 
scratching his scars and his open wounds, he says, can I come home with you? And the disciples are behind Jesus going, no, no. And he says, go tell your neighbors. And they all say, hallelujah, let's get in the boat and go home. Well, they get in the boat. And he returns back to Capernaum. But they no sooner get off in chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. And there's another series of stories that are intertwined because there's just a loaded group of people meeting him at the beach. And one of them is a fellow by the name of Jairus. And he runs the synagogue of the town, or he's one of the rulers of the synagogue. And his daughter is lying at the point of death. And, and, and Jesus is asked by this man, would you come, would you come and, and touch my daughter so that she would live? He begins to follow Jairus. He gets halfway up. It's not even that far. It's a couple of hundred feet. He gets halfway up and a woman comes up behind him who has an issue of blood. She's been, she, she lacks the coagulants in her blood. She's been bleeding and that makes her perpetually unclean. This is not a woman who can sleep with her husband. This is not a woman who can make sandwiches for her kids and send them to school. She can't live in her house. She has to be separated from the rest of the family. She is perpetually unclean. She spent everything she had to try and get better on physicians and you're going to be shocked, but they practiced on her and their practice didn't work and she was just out of money and out of time and she came to Jesus and she thought if I can just grab the hanging tassel that is on the side of his garment the symbol of his authority I will I can touch his authority and be made well the problem is she grabbed it and it came off in her hand she just lifted his credit card Jesus knowing somebody just lifted his credit card turned around and said who's got my credit card the woman's trembling because she doesn't mean to take it. She didn't mean to. She just wanted to touch it, but it came off in her hand. So she gave it to him, and he said, your faith made you whole. It, when, when you declared that my authority could make you well, that's what made you well. But thanks for my credit card back. And then he walked into Jairus' house. And when he got there, he only took three of the disciples. And he walked inside, and the girl was already dead. They had already sent a messenger. Don't bother the master. The girl's dead. When he got there, he walked in, and he said, she's not dead. She's sleeping. And they began to scoff at him. So he took the parents and three disciples and walked into her room. And he said, um, honey, get up. She got up, turned to the mother and said, feed her. And left. So you have this story of this woman who's in crisis, the story of this child that is, is about to get made well. And here's the thing. I love that Jesus finds himself constantly in a position where he's able to help people. And all it's doing is fueling the fans of, fa of fame in his life. And fame is the last thing he needs. See, as Americans, we read the gospel and we read how he's becoming famous and we read that as a good thing. But he keeps, twice he says in the gospel of Mark, we couldn't even eat. There was no time to sleep, there was no time to eat, there was no time to talk, there was no time to recover. That's not good, that'll kill you. So by the time we get to chapter 6, Jesus goes back to Nazareth and he gets a cold reception there. Well, I guess you left your mother standing outside Two chapters, and at the end of chapter three, you thought you were going to get a good reception? He got there, and he was struck by their unbelief in chapter six, verses one to six. He was struck by the fact that, that um, they really were so familiar with him, but didn't know him at all. He, he sent his messengers. He sent the disciples out in pairs. In chapter 6, verses 7 to 13, he said, I want you to go out, and I want you to proclaim that the king is here and the kingdom is here. Get them ready. Get them, get them repenting. And they went out, and he gave them the power to confront demonic powers. He gave them the power to heal the sick, and they went off two by two to all the villages around the Galilee. And while they were gone, a messenger came to Jesus and said, John the baptizer has been killed. So when the disciples came back, they came back excited. They wanted to share with Jesus all that happened, but Jesus, something was wrong. They, they saw that he was broken. So, so he said to them, all right, tell me about what you're doing. Tell me about what you experienced. Now let me tell you what the problem is. We need to get out of here. John the baptizer was executed. And I want to get you away for some rest. In chapter 6, verses 30 to 32, he says, we've got, we've got to get into a place where they stop interrupting our meals and we get a chance to rest. Now, he puts them in a boat. And everybody in the boat is thinking, we just had this cool experience and we are going to go for a rest. Do you, know, do you understand the feeling? We're just going to get a break. And they take the boat 
and they go out to the sea and they come around to the land and the people have followed them in the crowd along the shoreline watching where they went. So they step off the boat and, and Jesus looks at the people and he's moved by their need and the disciples look at the people and they're ticked off that their day off just got blown out. And so Jesus said, uh, I need you to feed the people. <laughs> you need us to feed the people? Yeah. Little becomes much when I touch it. Just let me take care of that part. He multiplied the victuals to 5,000 people. They went out and served. And then when they were done, each one of them got their own basket to bring back. Now, I got to tell you, they saw him do something powerful, but in their heart, they were just plain dried out. You ever been burned out? They're just burned out. So when the people were served, Jesus sent the disciples back to the boat and said, I'm going to go up and pray on the hillside. And the disciples go back to the boat with their basket going, I'm going to get a break. We didn't even get a break. We have got a basket of picked over already bread and fish. And they got in the boat. And it says that they went out in verses 45 to 52 of chapter 6 and they encountered helplessness. They forgot what it felt like to be helpless. So Jesus put them in the boat and the father went and rocked the boat. And they all threw their baskets up and held on to the side. What are we going to do? And Jesus was just up on the mountainside and looked out and said, oh boy. He went out into the water and he rescued them. They got back, and this time they didn't land at Capernaum. They went a little further down, maybe to get a little bit of a break. They went to Gennesaret, which is down the way from Capernaum, and, and it didn't work. The people thronged them there, too. They came in with a vengeance, and they were grabbing his cloak and trying to touch his tassel. You know why? Because it worked for that lady up the road. And all of a sudden, he can't move, and people are grabbing him. They don't have a way to control the crowd. And verses 53 to 56 say he turns and he's pressed, but he's healing and he's dealing with people's needs constantly. By the time you get to chapter 7, you have two contrasting stories in the 7th chapter, but both are the hearts of people. They're from very different directions. First, we have a story about um, uh, the teaching of the chief difference uh, between Jesus and the Pharisees. Here's the thing you need to know. The chief difference Jesus had with the Pharisees was Jesus taught the total depravity of man. The Pharisees taught something that would have been really well received by a psychologist convention in America today. He, he, the, the Pharisees taught that people really weren't basically bad, and if you, if you train them to do things the right way, that, that, that holiness would come from the outside to the inside. They had a certain way of washing their hands. They had a certain way of washing their dishes, and they said, why don't your disciples do it our way? And he said, you don't get it. What's wrong with man is inside. What's broke is in there. And flowing from that discussion... If you go on and read verses 14 to 23 of chapter 7, you'll find that there was a teaching concerning the inner brokenness of man. This is one of the great areas in which Judaism and Christianity has disagreed for years. Christians, biblical, Bible-studying Christians believe that man's not basically good. He was made basically good, but after the fall, it's been so marred, we call it the total depravity of man. Left to himself, he'll destroy himself. The second story was when he left. And this time he's not dealing with a, a Jew and he's not dealing with a religious person. He goes all the way up to the region of Tyre and Sidon in what is now southern Lebanon. And there he runs into this woman who comes and says, and says my, uh, my daughter has a demon. I need you to come and cast the demon out of my daughter. And he says, ma'am, I'm here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm, I'm not here for Gentiles. And she said, I understand. I understand you, that, that, that that's, that's what your mission is. And I understand that I don't deserve to be in your mission, but even the scraps that fall from the table can go to, to, to the dog at the floor. And that's me. I'll take whatever you can give me. Jesus saw her heart. And he turned and he cast the demon out of the daughter. What's interesting is he didn't even have to go see the daughter. He just said, your daughter's fine. Go home. You know what happens then. Now he's in a place where he hadn't been known, and she starts talking, and the daughter starts talking. 
And now everybody's talking. And so you read by the end of the chapter 7 that people began to appear and he opened the ears of the deaf and he made mute speak. And every time he made the mute speak, he, he said he, he, did, he did the same thing. I love this. He made the mute speak and then said, now don't tell anybody. I love that. I mean, here's a guy who can't speak. First words out of his mouth, he wants to say, let me go tell my neighbors, please don't. Chapter 8 includes five stories. And that sounds like a lot, but they're actually quite quick. The first one's the feeding of the 4,000, and that's separate from the feeding of the 5,000. It's a separate story. And Jesus fed the crowds, and this time he uses seven loaves and a couple of uh, small fish in verses 1 through 10. Shortly after that, having heard of all these wonders, the Pharisees come to him and say, you know, we've heard that you do all these signs. We'd like you to do a sign for us as well in verses 11 to 13. And he said, I'm not giving you a sign. I'm not a circus trick performer here. I'm not doing it. So he decides to move to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to escape the questioning of the Pharisees. And, and by the time you get to verses 14 to 16 of chapter 8, the disciples come hastily and they got in the boat and they laughed, but they forgot to bring bread. So he gets to the other side and they don't have bread. Now you have to understand, the meals are mostly bread and the bread is also what you dip to get the stew. In other words, that's the cutlery. You can't really eat without bread. And so he says, gentlemen, I pulled you out over there because of the leaven of the Pharisees. They heard the word leaven and they're stuck on the bread going, I think he's talking about the bread. And Jesus finally says, this is not a sly reference to the bread. Will you follow what I'm talking about here? You're thinking physical and I'm teaching spiritual. The thing is, the disciples were very much like the Pharisees. They had a hard time seeing which was really important, the broken heart of the man or the broken leg of the man. They kept reversing. Look at modern Christianity and the number of people that get excited about a healing of a body as opposed to the saving of a soul. I think it's interesting because he, at the end he says, look, I've already fed 5,000, I've already fed 4,000. Did you think I couldn't feed us? They're, you're worried about the wrong things. And that's very much like the disciples. Now, 826 to the end of the book is what we would call the parting ministry of Jesus. So we had the pre-ministry, then the popular ministry. And in 826, all the way to the end of the book, we have now the parting ministry. And it starts in a weird place. In Bethsaida, near Bethsaida, there's a little um, area at the end of chapter 8. And um, in verses 22 to 26, he heals a man. Do you remember this healing? He healed the man, but the first time the man saw people as what? Trees. And then he healed him again, and he saw them as people. And here's the thing. This begins a series of stories, and the reason that John Mark includes the story, I believe, is because the disciples sort of see who Jesus is, but they don't really see who he is. They sort of get it, but not really. They need a little bit more. And by the way, this section will end after a series of healings. The last healing he'll do is blind Bartimaeus. It's another blind man, and he gets to see as people as people. I think what's interesting is at the end of chapter 8, he takes the disciples away from the sea, north to the area of Mount Hermon. He's at the base of the mountain, and he gives them the final exam question. And he says... Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter comes out, you're Messiah, the son of the living God. And the very next passage is him rebuking Peter for getting too big for his britches. Because that's how fast the disciples lose it. Chapter 9 begins with the transfiguration of Jesus. Peter, James, and John saw it. But don't miss that in verses 9 through 13, it's, the, it's a, a warning of the time of the death, burial, and resurrection that right there, at the greatest moment of Jesus' transfiguration before them, is the words, by the way, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be death. When the, when the Peter, James, and John, and Jesus come back from the transfiguration, they get down to the bottom of the mountain in verses 14 to 29, and the rest of the disciples are gathered around, and they've been trying to cast out a muting spirit out of a man, but they've been unable to do it. 
And so Jesus casts out the spirit and the disciples are kind of feeling really humbled. You got three disciples that just saw him glow like the son of God that he is. You got nine of them that were just defeated and couldn't manage to get this demonic spirit out, even though they had been empowered. And now they're all back in one group. And what does Jesus do in 930 to 32? He says, I need to tell you that the suffering, death and resurrection is going to happen. The stir in the disciples starts. And for the rest of chapter 9, you're going to find that John grows upset because somebody else is casting out demons, but he's not on our team. And Jesus says, leave it alone. Hey, hey, Jesus is unconcerned. But what's interesting is he begins to teach them of real offenses. He said, listen, forget it. Forbidding children to come to me, that's a real offense. You got a hand, an eye, a foot causing you to sin? Get rid of it. That's a real offense. Stop playing around with all this other stuff. In chapter 10, he sets his face toward Jerusalem. Peter got right who he was, so it was time for him to start moving back to Jerusalem. Chapter 10 takes six months. All you have is just a few stories. And the first one is about divorce. But it's not about everybody's divorce. The problem is in chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, the king, the provincial ruler of that area called Perea, had just gotten a divorce that caused a massive scandal in the newspaper. It was so big a scandal that in the byline underneath the divorce was John the baptizer railing against it. Then John, of course, is arrested for that and later beheaded for making comments about it. So when they come to Jesus and say, hey, what do you think about divorce? They're not asking him about the theory of divorce. They're asking him about the one on the front page. They want him to take a stand against the king, just like John did. They're trying to set him up. And Jesus makes a very crafted answer about divorce. By the way, that divorce caused a war. That divorce caused a huge problem and got all the way to Rome and was in the Roman newspapers as well. Just about that time, in the middle of chapter 10, verse 17 to 27, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and and he says, uh, how do I get to eternal life? And Jesus says, did you keep the Torah? And he said, yes. And Jesus said, all right, then take the one thing that you treasure the most and lay it on the altar before me. Put, put your money down. Give it away. I'll take care of you. And he couldn't do it. But as he walked away in verses 28 to 31, you hear the muttering in the background. Peter remarks, well, we gave up everything for you. What are we going to get? And Jesus said, I want you to know something. There's not a single sacrifice anybody ever made that I don't pay back. So don't, don't, don't worry about that. And what's interesting is Jesus again then, in verses 32 to 35, stopped and foretold about his own suffering. He said, listen, guys, I'm giving up something too. I'm about to do it in a graphic way in front of you. After some time, James and John apparently didn't get the memo because they approached the master and said, hey, when you get into the kingdom, can we get really good spots on your right and on your left? Apparently, they didn't really understand what he was saying, so he turned and gave them a stark prophecy. You really want to get in with me? Let me show you what the future looks like. It's not nearly as fun as you think. Verses 36 to 45. And finally, they end up at Jericho, and they come to Bartimaeus, and they heal a blind man. Jesus heals the blind man. And when he does that, that long period of clarifying who he is comes to an end. And by now, some of the disciples are actually understanding who Jesus is, but they don't know what's going to happen. Chapter 11, through the end of the book, is all the story of the last week of Jesus' ministry. I'm going to take it off very fast for you, but the, the, the triumphal entry is in the beginning of chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, and then he comes halfway down the side of the, uh, the uh, Mount of Olives and sees a fig tree that has leaves but doesn't have any figs. There's something wrong with the fig tree, and he's trying to instruct the disciples because he's about to walk in the temple where he's going to see all the leaves of religion and none of the fruits of real faith. And so he says, something's wrong with this tree, and he curses the tree. And then he goes into the temple, and he curses the people there as well. Because the Jewish leadership inside that temple was doing a number of things that didn't please God. One of them was the money changers. And so he cleansed the temple of its money changers in verses 15 to 19. And they question him. And by the end of chapter 11, they're saying, by what authority do you do these things? Chapter 12 is in the middle of the week of tensions, and Jesus tells a story about a vineyard owner. 
who owned a vineyard and sent some different people to check on it and finally sent his son and they killed his son. Another overt statement of his own death. And they're trying to trap Jesus. And so they start in verse 13 to 17, they start a series of debates. You, you have a debate in 18 to 27 on the resurrection. You have a debate about taxes in 13 to 17. They're just going to try to erode his public confidence and try to get the people to start to see him differently. But there's one guy. I was fixated on this one guy in 28 to 30, 34 of chapter 12. He, Jesus asked, what's the greatest commandment? The man got it right. And Jesus began to say, here's a guy who's near the kingdom. He's almost there. And then he turned on the other leaders and said, you guys don't get it. This guy gets, you, you don't get it. By chapter 13, the disciples were impressed with the structure of the temple. They're going in and out of the temple. It's the week of Passover. There's, there's a couple of hundred thousand people pouring into the city, and everybody's impressed with this huge, huge temple. 1,560 feet down one wall, about 860 feet wide, huge platform. The largest temple in the world at the time, larger than anything in Rome, larger than anything anywhere on earth. And they walk out and they go, Lord, look at these beautiful buildings. He said, look really hard. Not one stone's going to be left standing on another. They said, when's that going to happen? And he said, well, let me tell you how it's going to happen. There's going to be some attempts to mislead you, 13.6. Fear is going to come up in verses 7 and 8. Uh, there's going to be persecution by your own people against you. Jews against Jews, 9 to 13. And then you're going to see the abomination of desolation. And then you're going, to, you're going to see the disruptions that accompany this great tribulation. And I want you to be alert because they're going to happen and the night is going to fall. By chapter 14, Jesus is at Bethany. A woman comes in and pours spikenard on his feet. And Judas complains. And the reason he complained is Judas is having a hard time fitting in when the plot is hatching behind the scenes. Two days later, verses 12 to 16 say Passover had come and Jesus sent two <coughs> disciples to follow a man to the place he prearranged the meal. The meal teachings are recorded by Mark in chapter 14, verses 17 to 26. But when he's leaving, he goes out and he's heading toward Gethsemane and it says that, that um, he stops and he tells them again that his death is coming and the disciples are going to be scattered. And Peter comes out with this pronouncement and says, in verses 27 to 31, oh, you don't have to worry, master. I will be faithful. I think when Peter told the story to John, uh, uh, to John Mark, and when John Mark wrote it down in the Gospel of Mark, I think it still stung Peter's heart. I think his own big words bit him. At Gethsemane, Jesus went to pray. The disciples went to sleep. Judas arrived, kissed him, and off he was taken. And, and, and Jesus was taken to the house of Joseph Caiaphas. And in chapter 14, verses 53 and following, you have uh, Peter making his way in with John. And Peter's denials happen in that courtyard. And by the end of chapter 14, you have a weeping Peter who has failed in what he said. I, he, in, in verses 27 to 31, I am the guy you can rely on. In verse 72, I'm the guy you can't rely on. Chapter 15 is the chapter of the crucifixion. Jesus is remanded from Caiaphas over into the hands of Pontius Pilate. And in verses 1 to 5, the provincial governor meets with Jesus. Jesus stops cooperating, stops talking, and Pilate figures he can release a prisoner because it's the time of the Passover. So he figures he can put in Jesus for the release. But in verses 6 through 15, it turns out that the crowd shouts him down and says, Crucify him! Crucify him! Release Barabbas. Release Barabbas. Eventually, Pilate gave permission to crucify Jesus in verses 16 to 20. And the men taunted him and mistreated him. It's interesting because this was written to Romans and they knew the character of their own soldiers and they could picture this just brilliantly. Eventually, they led him to the place where he was crucified in chapter 15, verses 20 to 30, 21 to 37. And there, they nailed him to a cross, and there he died. Chapter 16 is only nine verses long. I know it's longer in your Bible, but actually only the first eight verses are included in the best manuscripts. And so those first eight verses reveal that 
the women went to finish spicing and wrapping the body, and when they arrived at the tomb, the tomb was open, not closed. And it wasn't empty. Inside of it was a young man, not Jesus. And this one said, he's not here. He's risen. The end of the Gospel of Mark in the best manuscripts we have in history is verse 8. And some people couldn't stand that because it says that the women were fearful, that it ends in fear. And they said, that can't be the end. Now, there is a verses 9 to 20 that has been uh, snapped on by other manuscripts, but in your Bible, it will have a bracket around them because they're not in the best manuscripts. I think Mark's end was Peter's end, and I think that they ended on the fear of the disciples. You know why? Because I think the point of this, the point of this thing that you've patiently sat here and listened to is that there's constant combination of pressures on the, of the enemy against Jesus, and yet Jesus was undeterred and he continued his mission. I think that there was constant cluelessness and fearfulness of the disciples, and yet Jesus is victorious and accomplishes his mission. I think that re religious leaders misunderstood the value of the spiritual world and favored the physical world, and they didn't understand why the spiritual world was more significant, but Jesus remained clear and fulfilled his mission. I think that Jesus warned people about the religious people, and he warned them that they had broken standards, but Jesus continued to be clear and finished his mission. I think that there were seven different times in the book where Jesus said, both private and public to the disciples, I am going to face the cross, I am going to die, and I'm going to be raised again. And I think it ends with the fear of the disciples because that's what Christianity is. It's not a message of how good the disciples are. It's a message of how God got the job done in spite of the people that follow him. Right to this day, there's not a church that can claim that we are great because of us. And I think that the Gospel of Mark was an honest reflection by an honest Peter who knew that those disciples could foul up a two-car parade. And the fact of the matter is, the church does not raise triumphant because it raises such a great people. It is victorious because it is founded by Jesus Christ and we are the bride of one who, by the power of the Spirit, is getting us ready for a marriage. The Gospel according to Mark. Mm -hmm.